Okay, so reminder. Um, oh, I did not see the screen share. If you have, a, if you do not want to end up on YouTube, ask a question in the chat. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little more about how we do the measurement. And that matters because it gets into the motivation behind why we're doing all of this stuff with Rivet. Um, so what are, what are the, if you're trying to make a better measurement, you, I mean, you can always improve uncertainties, but you usually start by focusing on the largest uncertainties. Um, because that's the way you make the measurement more accurate, not by starting on focusing on the smaller ones. Um, so here is an overview of what you do in an actual jet analysis when you're doing the measurement. Um, you take your tracks, which are what you get out of a tracking detector. So it tells you where the particle went. It's also going to give you a measurement of the particle's momentum um, because this the detectors are in a magnetic field. So as the part charge particle curves in the magnetic field, um, it curves with a radius proportional to its it inversely proportional to its momentum. Um, and so you can measure the momentum that way. Um, no, it's proportional to the momentum. Uh, the you also get clusters from a calorimeter, which actually measures the energy deposit. Um, and that's what you put into your jet finding algorithm. So in the method sections of your papers, it's going to talk a lot about the detectors that were used and how it, uh, how you actually make, how they were calibrated and that type of thing. Um, you mostly, because you're looking at a model, can skim past that. Um, so you put it in your jet finding algorithm you get jet candidates. And we were talking about this background subtraction. So then you, you do some type of background subtraction algorithm. Um, and then that is, then you get a raw measurement like this. Um, and I, you can't see it here, but the zero is right there. So what you see is that you have some jets that it, it's giving you a result. It tells you the jet's momentum is negative. Now it does not make sense to have a negative um, magnitude of a vector. The reason that happens is because you have this smearing due to the background. So if you have on average um, a reasonable a reasonable amount of background is about 40 GeV. So if you're trying to measure, if you're trying to measure a, a 40 GeV jet on av and you have an extra 40 GeV uh, of energy there, you will measure it to be 80 GeV. You subtract it off and you get 40 GeV, but that 40 GeV of background has a standard deviation of about 20 GeV. So sometimes you're going to measure something, you're going to end up measuring a negative jet energy because you just have statistical fluctuations and your actual background was lower than the average background. So we're always subtracting the average background in the event, but the actual background for any individual jet may, may be higher or lower. So that leads to smearing and that's why you get these negative jets with negative momenta. Um, and well, this plot actually shows something a little different. It's showing you that uh, your result, if you require a 2 GeV, 5 GeV, 8 GeV, or 10 GeV jet, you see suppression of the negative, of jets with negative momentum. So, uh, so this is what these spectra right here, this is the raw measurement of what you guys um, will have, will calculate in your rivet analysis. The problem is that you have massive smearing because of momentum resolution. So because I actually think this, if I remember correctly, the standard deviation in this bin was 20 GeV. So the, the standard deviation of the background. So you're going, whatever the real answer is, you're going to have 
some jets move up in energy and some move down, it massively distorts the spectrum. So you do something called unfolding, which corrects the spectrum. I'm going to talk a little more about on unfolding and it gives you a final result. Unfolding shows up in other fields as um, different terms. Um, deconvolution is a common term. Um, and here's the basic problem. So you have um, some set of something you're trying to measure. So you're after measuring new, the true values of something. And you can put this in a vector. So just if you went back to your uh, spectra, you could have each data point be one entry in a vector. And what you actually measure is mu. <clears throat> so this is, in this case, the mu are actually the different entries in here and you are after the new, the true values. Um, so a few things can happen from, if you want to get your, um, if you want to get the true values from your measured values, well, an easy thing is, well, you could have a background term. So this would represent a constant background. Um, so if all you had were background, it's easy. You just subtract off the background. The problem is this response matrix. So um, what this says, so if you have, so if you have a jet, which is really, um, I actually realized this slide has this written incorrectly because you would actually, ah, this would be, yeah. We have the, we, we usually calculate the inverse of the response matrix, not the actual response matrix. So if you have a, if you have a jet, which is really a 40 GeV jet, and then you have this background that is added to it and you can subtract off the average background, but the background as a standard deviation of 20 GeV, what that means is that a real jet, that a real 40 GeV jet, um, on it, when you do your background subtraction, on average, you're going to measure it at 40 GeV, but if there's a 20 G, if there's a 20 GeV um, spread in the in the background, if the standard deviation of the background is 20 GeV, then here you're going to let me actually make this blue and. <clears throat> then 67% of the time, you are going to measure the jet to be between 20 and 60 GeV. And then about 97% of the time, you're going to measure it to be between zero and 80 GeV. But any given time you measure a for any given 40 GeV jet, you would you would could measure it any number of you might get any number of actual results. You're not going to measure the real result. So far, so clear. Yes. Yes. Okay. So. Um, then the response matrix is basically telling you for a given set of the way this is written for a given true value um what are the or sorry for a given measured value what were the true values that corresponded to that um measured value so and here I actually, yeah, so let me make, um, 
this actually, this equation should be, I don't know how I used this slide multiple times and didn't catch this. Uh, the measured value is equal to the response matrix times new plus beta. Have I confused everybody? I just screwed up my terminology on the slide. So now we want new, we want the true value. How do we do that? The background is easy. The, um, and my notation is not, I have typos on my slide. I may want to re-record this, but I will probably still post this on YouTube just to have it up there. Um, so <clears throat> the true value is the inverse of the response matrix times the measured value minus the background. The problem is that we don't, that we actually have, um, uh, I should double check, that the problem is that this is, you know, if you had a stable matrix, you could just invert the matrix and you could get the answer that you want. The problem is that the inversion is not stable. Um, and I'm, you don't need to actually apply any of this. So I'm going to go over this extremely lightly. Um, you can invert the matrix, but the problem is that you're actually getting the matrix from Monte Carlo simulations, which are themselves subject to statistical fluctuations. So um, if you try to invert the matrix, it is numerically unstable and it will usually give you an answer with a lot of fluctuations. Um, and there is a question and I'm, the question is, is this somewhat similar to neutron flux unfolding from neutron activation and subsequent gamma analysis from activated foils? I think so. Um, I would have to know a little bit more, but if what you're doing is trying, so you're trying to determine the neutron flux from measurements of gammas after the neutrons activated a foil. Okay, yes. And then that's probably, so when you do something like that, your the fact that you have that you didn't directly measure the neutron, but instead measured the gammas is gonna mean that your resolution on that is extremely poor, hence why you have to do unfolding. You only have to do unfolding if your resolution is poor. So if that response matrix is nearly, I don't wanna say diagonal because it, does, it has to be, um, so you can have, you have to have a roughly linear relationship. If you have a roughly linear relationship with little smearing between um, between bins, it's a then you can do this inversion quite stably. So um, if you have a matrix which, through some manipulations, you can kind you can write approximately as an identity matrix, or maybe with small numbers near the diagonal, you can usually invert that fairly stably. But if you have large numbers far from the diagonal, the, the inversion is not stable. Um, and you could have it not be diagonal, but there's, there's still um, some region which, so like, a diagonal matrix means that if you're measuring the energy, you're always measuring the correct energy. You could always measure the energy divided by a factor of two, but with no smearing, and then it's no problem. The problem is when you get smearing, usually due to some measurement error that's being some uncertain, some smearing in the, the measurement itself. So the state of the art algorithm in um, high energy 
is something, well, the standard, I should say, because there's actually several different algorithms to it. You're basically using a numerical algorithm to invert this matrix. Um, and when you do that, you are, um, you know that there's numerical fluctuations in whatever you think the matrix is. Um, so you're going to use some type of regularization or, um, or additional knowledge. Um, so there is a regular regularization algorithm called SVB um, that I don't have in my slides at all. Um, it only works in one dimension. And then there's a Bayesian method. So Bayesian means that you are using some initial guess um, and starting there. Um, and you're working from that to get your, um, your actual measurement. Um, so I think I will not go through the details except to say that if you guys ever need to do this, there are papers and you can wade through them. There are also lovely implementations of the algorithms that handle things numerically quite well. Um, so I'm, uh, so I would generally recommend doing a literature search before you actually implement anything yourself. The, there's a saying that an hour spent in the library can save, save, save a year in the lab. Um, it's a good idea to actually do a literature search. So we use a standard, there's a standard high energy package called Rue Unfold. Um, and what you can see here, this is in the sample histograms made by the package. Um, the red line is what you have measured, um, and the blue line is the truth, and I cannot read my students' um, legend for what the, the green line is. So red is what you measured, and uh, blue is the truth, and how do you get what you actually measured? Um, here, um, this is showing you the... Uh, this matrix here, this histogram here is the matrix. So the um, this dimension is um, measured and this one is truth. And what you see here is that almost all of the values are um, near one, near the diagonal. So this is a very, um, this would be a measurement that with a good resolution. Um, and you do the unfolding and you get back to the, um, you get back to the correct answer with some smearing. So that's unfolding. Um, so when you're doing a jet measurement, and I should add, I'm not expecting you guys to have absorbed all of this. Um, I want you to get to see the big picture. So in a jet measurement, you usually construct your response matrix. You can do it a couple different ways. A way which works approximately is to have some resolution from your detector, um, just because your detector isn't great, some resolution just from your background fluctuations. And in principle, they're approximately factorizable so you can get the two terms. We actually, Antonio showed that they aren't really factorizable. Um, so this has its limits. Um, and let's see, I want to emphasize that while this is a detector effect, this background component is not a detector effect. So the reason why I'm making you sit, listen to me say this, this, these background fluctuations, you have background in a Monte Carlo model. Um, so you will, also have this smearing in the model. So if you want to compare to the model, you have to, you are going to actually also have to unfold. You guys will not um, because we ca carefully selected your papers to be proton-proton collisions, but in principle, it should be done. And my um, animations are screwed up on the side. So let me just an animate them all in. Um, so a few things about unfolding. De Agostini, who is the author of the Bayesian unfolding algorithm, in multiple of his papers says that you should avoid it if you can. 
That is the person who came up with the algorithm says you shouldn't do it if you don't have to. Um, what I have noticed in high energy is a tendency to assume that if someone's doing unfolding, it's a better measurement. Uh, <laughs> that is not necessarily true. Um, it is necessary when the resolution is poor. Um, so if you're talking about single particle spectra, so you guys have now implemented a cross-section histogram at least, so it's a normalized spectrum. Uh, the momentum resolution is, in those cases, is on the order for, a, a, it's usually between 0.1 to 1% for uh, contemporary experiments for the momentum resolution. So if you look at the lowest momentum bins measured by a least, the momentum bin is 200 to 250 MeV per C and a 1%, um, well, and Elise's resolution is 0.1%. So um, for the Elise detector, then uh, you have an uncertainty on the order of 0.2 to 0.25%, um, and, or sorry, 0.2 to 0.25, MEV per C, and you have a bin width of 50 MEV. So in that case, your resolution, your uncertainty is less, you know, less than 100 times your, um, your bin width. So you don't worry too much about bin migration, that is that if you measure a particle to be, to have 225 MeV in the Elise detector, it has, it is in the correct bin in your histogram. You, it is, you can be pretty confident that it is between 200 and 250 MeV. Jet spectra are different because the best detectors for measuring jets still have an energy resolution of 10%. Um, and a 10% resolution is qualitatively different from a 0.1 or a 1% resolution. So if you are measuring jets, um, a typical jet measurement, and Elise has, uh, all your papers are from Elise, and Elise has about a 20% energy, 20% uh, momentum resolution. So um, if we take a 50 G, if we take a 50 GeV jet and a 10% energy resolution, I should be doing 50 GeV per C, but I'm used to working in particle physics units um, where C is one. Um, Okay, so a 50 GeV jet with a 10% uh, resolution has a 5 GeV uncertainty, but the actual, but in a lease, it's a 10 GeV uncertainty. So your typical bin, you might measure in this range a 40 to 60 GeV bin. Um, and then your bin width is 20 and your resolution is, your bin width is 20 GeV, your resolution is 10 GeV. So if you measure a particle, if you measure a jet to have 50 GeV with a 10 GeV standard deviation on that, it's only going to be in the correct bin two thirds of the time. So your resolution is poor compared to your bin width. When that's true, you usually need to, well, you would usually benefit from, uh, from unfolding. The algorithm also assumes that your response matrix is correct. Um, it's kind of hard to move forward if 
you don't have the if you don't have an understanding of your resolution. But again, if you're talking about measuring something we understand well, um, to to use the example brought up in in the questions where you're measuring neutrons from the activation of gammas, if if you don't know how likely neutrons are to activate something, you're not going to know the answer correctly. And neutrons are dang hard to measure. So the answer is probably that you don't actually know how, I, I, I don't know anything about that particular problem, but my guess is that you don't actually have a good constraint on it. Um, so, in high energy, the issue is that, you know, we're often trying to measure something that nobody has ever measured before. So we often don't really even know how correct our, our response matrix is. Um, which isn't to say we shouldn't do it, but it's just that you should approach this with caution. And I would say also, um, if the author of a particular algorithm says you shouldn't do it, then if you don't have to, you should take notice. Um, I, let me skip past the last set of, of bullets. Um, so the jet energy resolution is fundamentally, uh, so how, oh, wonderful question. How do you know if the results are valid? That is, that is the key question. Um, usually it's, so you have to have, I would say I am wary of many measurements in the field because I think they've underestimated their uncertainties, sometimes massively. Um, you usually, to do anything, you usually have to have some level of confidence that your, you know, in this case, I'm saying response matrix, but it's basically your detector response. The, the way your detector responds to a, to a high energy particle, you have to have some confidence that you are in the right ballpark. The way that you usually do this is that you generate the response matrix in different ways under different assumptions. So um, it's, it's a little bit, so a big thing for jets is how the particle breaks into its final state particles. Um, and we have, so as an example, we know that about two thirds of the final state particles will be charged and one third will be neutral. The ELISE detector does not measure neutrals. Well, it only measures, it only measures electromagnetic particles, which effectively means neutral pions. Um, so one thing you can do to get an uncertainty is change the relative fraction of charged and neut neutral particles. And you can crank this up by hand within reasonable ranges. Um, one of the things that can affect this is actually what's in one of the papers, I think two of the papers, fragmentation functions, which is where you look at the energy of the final state particles. Um, it's easier to measure high energy particles than low energy particles. So, uh, you can you can go in and change the fragmentation function in your simulation within what you think are reasonable values. Um, and whether or not the measurement is right also depends. So it's not every measurement should have an uncertainty. So it's is the uncertain does the uncertainty contain the true values? We hope so. One thing this, but this is actually. A big part, you'll notice that all of these high energy, well, you probably haven't noticed because you guys don't don't watch high energy experiments, but usually we have more than one detector and you never put in the proposal. Like this doesn't work for funding agencies, but it should. 
you like to measure the same thing more than once with two different experimental apparatuses because um, the odds that someone will make a mistake is just too high. And we've had more than a few cases where different experiments measured different things and we had to go back and figure out what who was right. It's a hard question. Um, and some things I think are not right. And some there's often stuff in the literature um, that is actually wrong. Um, and you should be particularly wary of things where there was one measurement in the 1960s and someone, and there was a three author paper and nobody measured anything since then. You often find things like that where um, sometimes even for important values, there's been exactly one measurement. Um, this is particularly true, and I'm mentioning this because of because of the nuclear engineer in the room. Uh, sometimes you will have something where there's some cross section for an interaction between two particles, and it was measured in 1973, and it had a 25 percent uncertainty, and it was done by one. You know, there's only one measurement. That's all you got to work on. But you hope your measurement is not actually sensitive to whether or not that other measurement is correct, because sometimes they're actually wrong, and sometimes quite wrong. Not everything in the literature is right. Okay, so that's also why. We like to have, we like to go back and make sure we understand it theoretically. You guys are working on stuff that mostly is not the end. The models don't appear wildly different from the actual, um, from the measurements. Um, are physicists revalidating these experiments in the past? Sometimes. But it's really, it can be really hard to get funding for, to repeat a measurement that was done before. Um, it has to be an important measurement. So sometimes you have, for instance, some of these neutrino measurements are really sensitive to the cross sections, uh, to nuclear cross sections because the detectors are built out of actual material, um, which means that you have to know what happens with nuclei. Um, but it has to be sufficiently important. The measurement has to be useful usually, and you either have to be able to make an argument, you'll be able to do it with lower uncertainty, which you usually can, or that it is so important, you have to go back and double check it anyways. Um, and actually some of what you're seeing is that sometimes nuclear engineers are going back and repeating old nuclear physics experiments because the original experiment was done in the 60s and 70s with humongous error bars and very low statistics. And actually, it turns out that we really would benefit a lot from having a much higher precision measurement. Um, so sometimes it's not the physicists going back and repeating it. It's whoever needs the measurement done better. Um, if you learn anything from what I've said today, the thing I want to stick is that jet measurements are hard. They are just hard. Um, the energy resolution is fundamentally large. Um, theoretical calculations are a little bit easier, be, at, at least on the Monte Carlo level, because you throw everything in the blender and out pops a jet candidate, and it may or may not be right, but it should be comparable to the data. Um, Unfolding is hard and complicated and unstable and uh, often unnecessary. Um, and you got to be really sensitive about those assumptions that you're making. Um, OK, so how to compare to models, which is why we're here. Um, at the very beginning, I said, well, what do we use for our jet algorithms? You, and we said the snow mass accord said, apply the same algorithm to your data and the model and then the calculation, um, then the calculation and the measurement should be comparable. So the rivet philosophy is basically the same. Apply the same algorithm to data and the model, and then your I actually should say are comparable, not are the same. Then the measurement and the calculation are comparable. Um, 
so some of these things you may or may not have the right definition of um of background and whatever you call your background it's always a little bit heuristic but uh if you do the same thing in data and model, they will at least be comparable. So you guys already know a little, you guys already know what rivet is, that it takes in these, um, it pulls data from the HEP data database, it reads in a HEP MC, and you apply the analysis logic, and you get these comparisons um, between data and models. And why should we use rivet? Well, first of all, it facilitates these comparisons. So once you guys finish your rivet analyses, and if we can get this into the repository, anybody who ever wants to compare to those data can. Um, and nobody has to repeat. What the current way that people do it is that they actually go in and they have, theorists have to write the analysis logic themselves. And that means that fewer theorists compared to the models as well. Um, it's not that hard. Um, compared to many of the things we do, and it preserves the analysis details. So the big thing that's the reason why you guys are all doing proton proton jet measurements is because it actually wasn't clear when we went back this summer and tried to figure out what had happened, which particles went into the jet finder when uh, our colleagues had done these corrections. So that's a really important thing to do. So no. So let me skim past this. So if you are doing a full Monte Carlo <clears throat> model comparison to between, if you're trying to use rivet to do a full comparison, when you had the analysis steps in data, you were doing unfolding and you were unfolding, your unfolding was correcting for detector effects, what particles you didn't measure, but it was also correcting for this background. And you don't have de detector effects in the model, but you do have background. So if you want to do a full comparison when in a large background environment, you have to do unfolding. You guys are lucky that, well, uh, my husband says labor, luck means labor under correct knowledge. Um, I didn't assign you heavy ion measurements, but Antonio and I uh, later in the semester will submit a paper showing that really to get everything right, you should be unfolding when to make comparisons to models um, for heavy ion collisions. So you would have to do all of those. So you take your particles, you put them in a jet finding algorithm, you get out jet candidates, you do your background subtraction, you get a raw spectrum, you unfold for the, the um, the background fluctuations, and then you get a corrected spectrum from for for the Monte Carlo model. Um, you guys are lucky in that you're basically working on measurements where this matrix is um, is diagonal, um, so you don't have to. We have no background, um, so in, we have almost no background in proton-proton collisions. So you're going to neglect the smearing due to background. Okay, so let me skip that slide. Um, so I think most of this is not so relevant to the class. Um, but basically you should remember that we're, if you remember nothing, remember unfolding is hard. Um, let me see if there's any questions and then I'll turn the recording off. And then I'll ask for more questions. All right, I will turn the recording off. <clears throat>